The Peter Schiff Show. Well, before I get into some of the economic news of the past couple of days, obviously the big event today was the terrorist attack in Belgium. And I'm not sure uh, if we have many listeners to this podcast in Belgium. I'm sure we probably do. And I certainly want to offer my condolences uh, to the people of Belgium and on behalf also of uh, my other podcast listeners around the world and here in the United States. Obviously, our hearts go out to everybody who was impacted by yet another terrorist attack. Uh, Of course, there are some political ramifications probably in the United States. It probably will work to the benefit of Donald Trump, who didn't waste much time in capitalizing on this, although other candidates, of course, uh, you know, grab their their time in, in the spotlight to, of course, condemn the attacks and to promise a more vigorous uh, fight against uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda uh, should they be elected president. But we do have a couple of primaries today, Arizona, which I think Trump is pretty much uh, well in the lead there. It's a winner take all state. But if there was any doubt as to who would win, I think today's attacks in Belgium will solidify that uh, for Donald Trump. The wild card will be the Utah primary, where I think Donald Trump is in last place in the polls. You know, Mitt Romney came in and basically he didn't endorse uh, Cruz, but he said vote for Cruz so we can vote against Trump. And if Cruz can get 50 percent of the votes, he will get all the delegates in that state. So obviously that is the goal. What Donald Trump would hope to do and maybe today's terrorist attack could help him would be to get enough votes to deny Cruz a majority so that the delegates end up being split up proportionally, in which case uh, Trump could still grab some of those delegates. He wouldn't he wouldn't win and get all of them, but he would get some of them to add to his winner take all delegates that he is going to grab in Arizona. Not much action really in the markets. The gold did run up initially as it often does, you know, oh there's a terrorist attack, something went wrong. The price of gold spiked up. I think I saw it as high as up 13 bucks at one point. But uh, it didn't really finish with much of a gain, although positive. I think it closed up just under five dollars, uh, just about twelve forty eight an ounce. Silver was up earlier this morning. It was up back at sixteen dollars again. It's building up some nice resistance up there, but I think it's going to take it out because it hasn't been able to fall back much below. I think we closed today up about four cents at fifteen eighty six. So there's a lot of support building in the silver market. And I know I had mentioned on this podcast before. I noticed that there were some traders that were shorting silver and buying gold, looking at the breakout in the price of gold relative to the price of silver, thinking that it would continue. And for my money, I think it's more likely that you'd want to fade that breakout because when gold gets this expensive relative to silver, I wouldn't want to bet that that trend continues. I'd want to bet that you revert more to the mean. I think that's uh, probably the safer bet. And there, I I think some of these people that are putting on that trade are going to get hurt. I would say if you like gold, just buy gold. Don't short silver because you could turn a winning trade into a losing trade. If you don't like silver, just don't buy it uh, or don't don't do the trade at all. But the big uh, action in the currency markets was in the British pound. I mean, really, the other currencies didn't do much. In fact, the commodity currencies, the Aussie dollar continues to rise against the U.S. dollar, Canadian dollar up again today. European currencies were a little bit weaker, but the main weakness was in the British pound. And you might think, well, why? You know, they attacked uh, continental Europe. Wouldn't that hurt the euro more? I mean, Brussels, right, is, you know, the headquarters of the eurozone. Uh, Why isn't the euro being hurt more than the British pound? Because the terrorists didn't attack the UK. They attacked the eurozone. Uh, So why is the pound getting pounded and not the euro? And the reason is that traders now believe that this terrorist attack somehow makes a Brexit. And that what that means is Great Britain exiting the EU. So instead of a Grexit, when they were talking about Greece, now they're talking about a Brexit uh, where the B is uh, Britain, right? And Britain leaving uh, the EU. And before, you know, there was a there was a question of, with Scottish independence. They were thinking about leaving uh, the United Kingdom. And now it's about the entire United Kingdom 
uh, leaving the EU. And the idea is that's somehow going to be bad for Britain. And that's why the pound is falling. I don't know if it's going to be good or bad. I mean, it, it could be very good for Britain. It all depends on what they do after they leave the EU, because membership in the EU isn't all that it's cracked up to be. There are a lot of problems with being uh, part of uh, the EU. And so to potentially it could be a positive. So that could be shaping up for a good trade in the British pound, especially if it keeps selling off and then we actually get a Brexit. There could be a big opportunity there, you know, buy the rumor, sell the fact. And of course, it, it could end up being a blessing, maybe not even in disguise uh, for a Britain. Let me move on, though, to the economic data that came out uh, yesterday and today. Most of it weaker than expected, consistent with what I've been saying about the underlying weakness in the U.S. economy and the fact that we may, in fact, already be in a recession. They were expecting a bounce in the Chicago Fed National Activities Index. That came out yesterday. And instead of a plus 0.25, we got a minus 0.29. That's about the lowest this index has been in two years. Now, they did increase the positive number for last month, which made people hopeful that maybe things were turning around. It was originally reported as up 0.28, and now they said no, it was actually up 0.41. So the bounce that we got in January was a little bit bigger than what we were first told, but that only makes the decline in February that much more dramatic because we've gone all the way from 0.41 down to minus 0.29 when the consensus was looking for you know, the, the gains to be held holding. 0.28 last month, 0.25 in February, but no, a big disappointment. This is one of the biggest misses in that series. But I think the bigger miss or the worst number that came out was the existing home sales. And that was a huge decline. It was a 7.1% drop month over month in existing home sales. That's the biggest drop in six years. And it's the third consecutive month where existing home sales have gone down. And the big problem that they're pointing to is that the prices are too high. Now, imagine what would happen if the Federal Reserve actually were to raise interest rates two more times, right? That's what they're pretending now, two times this year. And of course, you know, they're going to keep raising them uh, in subsequent years. But if the Fed were to raise interest rates, what does that do to mortgage rates? Well, they go up also. And when home sales are falling sharply because they're unaffordable, they're unaffordable even with record low mortgage rates. So what happens to affordability if mortgage rates go up? Well, houses become even less affordable than they are now. So how is the Fed going to increase mortgage rates when they're already not low enough to sustain the market, even though they're at rock bottom? And, you know, part of the other problem they're claiming is, well, there's a lack of inventory. The main reason there's a lack of inventory, I think, is because there's no buyers at these prices. I mean, people are probably waiting for some kind of indication that buyers are there before listing their properties. Or maybe some of the uh, the sellers don't even want these prices. They actually want higher prices because they might still be underwater on their mortgages, depending on what part of the country they live in. And so they may be hoping that prices go up and then maybe they want to list their properties. Meanwhile, nobody can afford to buy the properties that are already on the market. And the only thing that is keeping these overpriced homes affordable is the artificially low interest rates, courtesy of the Fed. And, of course, the government, through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, subsidizing, and the FHA, subsidizing these, um, these mortgages by allowing people to buy with practically nothing down. I mean, if people had to put 10% or 20% down, I mean, these home sales would be even weaker. And, of course, the other problem that is influencing affordability is the lack of viable jobs. The fact that the Americans who are employed in this economy, and everybody wants to boast about how unemployment is so low, but these people who have gotten jobs during this so-called recovery are not able to use their paychecks to, to qualify for a mortgage because the jobs they got pay so little or they work so few hours that there's no way that they can utilize that uh, even with 3% down, they can't swing a mortgage even with these really low prices. And so they they end up renting. 
Also this morning, we got the PMI Manufacturing Index, and this was supposed to supposed to improve on last month. Last month, we had a 51 even, which is dangerously close to 50, which is the borderline uh, between expansion and contraction. And so we got 51, and they were looking for an improvement all the way up to 52.4. Well, we did improve but only a 41.4. So we were a full one point below what experts were looking for. And that's still a very, very weak number, not consistent with the type of economic growth that the Fed is talking about. The one outlier so far of the week that we got today was this Richmond Fed number coming out of left field. Last month, February was minus four. And the consensus was for a zero for this month. And we ended up getting plus 22. I mean, that was the biggest beat that there's ever been. I mean, I'm looking at this chart on the uh, on, on Bloomberg's website. This is the highest number uh, going back to 2012. May, I, may, it could be e- even longer than that before we've seen a, uh, a Richmond Fed number this high. I mean, the number is so high, it just looks very suspicious to me that it's some kind of aberration, some kind of statistical fluke. I don't know what happened this month. We'll have to find out next month and see what kind of revision they make to this plus 22 or what happens to the subsequent month. Is it a big collapse so that, you know, what uh, what March gives, April takes away? But all the other reports that we've got so far this week are weak. And so if we get one kind of outlier like that, I'm not going to jump to any kind of conclusions about this is saying there's some kind of big turnaround in the manufacturing sector because this one uh, Fed survey shows a number that's so, you know, out of the realm of what anybody was looking for. Again, I'm not going to jump to any kind of conclusions. You know, one of the interesting stories of the week that I put on my, my website was the government basically garnishing wages from students who were delinquent in their their student loans. And the article points out how delinquencies are rising despite the fact, despite the fact that these income-based repayment programs are, are now in wide use. And there's been a huge increase in the number of, uh, of debtors that have decided to take advantage of these income-based repayment programs where your loan payments are limited based on your income. And in fact, in the last year, there's been a 48% increase in the number of people who have signed up and enrolled in these income-based programs. And so because their payments are now so low, they're not delinquent. I can only imagine how much higher the delinquency rate would be in student loans if students couldn't avail themselves of these um, income-based repayment programs. And in fact, I think that the incentives in many cases will be for students to favor lower paying jobs because lower paying jobs might actually net a higher paycheck if the lower paying job enables you to qualify for a lower income-based student loan payment. Because remember, you know, you get out of college and you got to start paying these student loans as soon as you get a job. And if the job that you're offered, if the pay is just high enough so that you don't qualify for a reduction, it's possible that if you take a lower paying job, that net you could end up with more money. And of course, you know, when you, when you, whatever you get paid, you get taxed on. So you get taxed on what you earn. But if you get an, a lower paying job, then a portion of your debt gets forgiven. So this is the moral hazard that you get when it comes to uh, to the government. And one of the things I've talked about, too, is that in a free market, the incentive would be to major in the type of major that is going to give you the highest paying job. If you're going to go out and spend a bunch of money to go to college, you should invest in a degree that is going to pay off, where the expected income the future income is a lot greater than the current cost to obtain that degree. And maybe you're, you know, in in computer science or engineering or something like that. But with these income-based plans, the government actually creates an incentive for people who want to go into low-paying fields, right? Where social work, for example, where, you know, they're not going to get a lot of money. But the incentive is get the most expensive degree that you can, go to the most expensive college and then get a master's degree or PhD 
and then take a low paying job. Because by taking that low paying job, and there might be a lot of personal satisfaction in this low paying job, you know, it doesn't have all the stress that a higher paying job is going to have in that kind of uh, stressful environment. I mean, maybe people are passionate about something and what they're passionate about doesn't pay very much. See, normally, if a job doesn't pay a lot, the market would create an incentive for you not to invest a lot and gain the degree for a career that's not that lucrative. But what the government has done is says, hey, if you want to go into a career that's not very lucrative, run up a huge bill while you're in college because you can have this huge bill and then your income is going to be so low, you're barely going to have to repay any of that loan and then it's all going to be forgiven. See, that's the other part about these income-based uh, repayment plans is that once you make these low payments over a certain period of time, you're done. The rest of the loan is forgiven. You don't, you never have to pay it back. So if your income stays low enough, long enough, uh, a big chunk of your loan gets forgiven. Now, of course, who's got to pay for that? Well, the taxpayer, right? The taxpayer has to pay for it uh, because somebody's got to do it. The loan's been guaranteed if it, was, if it was initiated by a bank. But of course, now one of the things that the Obama administration did is they cut out the banks, and now it's the government itself that is just making these student loans. So, of course, the government directly loses, or the taxpayer directly loses, when the student doesn't repay. It's not that the government has to make good a guarantee of a private loan. It's just the money is just lost. Now, I put up an interesting article. I hadn't even noticed it until a few days. You know, It came out like a week ago, and it had to do with RBS, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, firing about 220 of their investment advisors and replacing them with uh, robotic advisors. I mean, automated. I mean, they're not actually robots. It's just a commu computer that acts as kind of like a robo-advisor. And, and basically what you do is you, you create a program that basically has all sorts of cookie-cutter uh, investment allocations. And the individual client of RBS uh, would interact with a computer program, just like, you know, when you go in... Uh, you, you make a you call an airline and you get into a voicemail and they ask you a bunch of questions and you don't talk to an actual human being. You talk to uh, you talk to a computer. Well, the same thing is going to happen. You ask for an investment advisor and you get a computer and the computer just reads you these standard questions and it asks you, you know, how old are you? You know, what's your income? What are your investment objectives? It maybe it'll give you some choices. And once it gets all this information about you, it's just going to spit out a pre-programmed asset allocation uh, that, that meets whatever the criteria uh, that RBS or the government would say is suitable or appropriate for somebody who answered the questions the way they did, right? Why have a human being just have a machine? And so let's fire uh, the humans. Now, of course, what they're doing is they're doing this for their smaller accounts, right? So larger accounts, I think if you have over 300,000 or something like that, you can have a human being. But if you don't have a large enough account, well, all you can deal with is, is this robot. And, you know, why are they doing that? Because you think, oh, you know, people always talk about, oh, it's the minimum wage workers that are going to lose their jobs, right? When we're going to automate and we're going to get rid of the fast food workers. And yeah, they're going to lose their jobs because of the minimum wage. But it's not just low-skilled people that get impacted by government regulations and that lose their jobs. Because believe me, the average person would prefer to discuss his investment portfolio with a human being, not a voicemail system, right? I mean, if you can imagine how frustrating it is to talk to the airlines or any other companies where you don't have a human being, you know, to deal with your investment portfolio. But why are they doing this? It's because of regulations. It's because of uh, liability. And this is going to be the trend. I think this is going to happen wide scale in the United States, especially if these new rules that the president is thinking about, or I believe are going to be imposed from the, the Labor Department on broker dealers, uh, creating this fiduciary responsibility for all retirement accounts, which is really going to be a regulatory and litigation nightmare. I think one of the ways that brokerage firms are going to try to mitigate this is by getting rid of the human beings, getting rid of their uh, personal advisors, because you don't have to worry about rogue investment advice. You see, the, where the firms uh, have a risk is if the advisor tells the broker to do something 
that then in hindsight, the client can claim wasn't suitable or, you know, it was unauthorized. There's all sorts of different things. But if the client is only dealing with a computer, then none of that can happen. You can't, if the computer has this program and you've got to answer these questions and then the computer gives you a portfolio based on what you said, and it's all automated and it's all recorded, uh, you know, in, in a computer log, you know, you can't, you've got no lawsuit. You really can't sue the computer claiming that the advice wasn't appropriate or wasn't suitable or wasn't authorized because it's all going to be there. You know, when it's, when it's just a human being alleging something, it's one person's word against another person's word. And, and sometimes a broker does do something that's unsuitable. Sometimes brokers do do bad things uh, and the firms don't know about it. But if you don't have an actual broker, if the firms are in charge of a computer program, the computer program can never do anything wrong. I mean, unless it's programmed to, it's going to do exactly what RBS. So RBS doesn't have to worry. Any client who is a small investor who is dealing with one of their computers, they know they're going to get the exact investment advice that has been pre-programmed into that software based on the responses that their, um, their, you know, their, their customers are entering or, or, you know, either they're voicing it or they're pushing a button or whatever they're doing. So this is going to dramatically reduce the liability, the legal liability for the broker dealer of being sued because something went wrong. And also, you know, there's all kinds of things now, you know, brokerage firms can be sold, can be sued if they're selling away. That's a claim where, you know, you employ a broker and then the broker, unbeknownst to you as the broker dealer, you know, it tells somebody to invest in, in something that you know nothing about. And it doesn't even have to be a client of the broker. I've seen selling away cases where the firms have been sued by people who never even had an account with the brokerage firm, but they had a relationship with the broker and the broker gave them some bad advice. They lost money and then they go back and they sue the firm. They don't sue the broker because the broker doesn't have any money. They look for the deep pocket. So by replacing brokers with a computer program, that never happens. You don't have to worry about your computer program selling away because it's impossible. It can't sell away. So all of the rules and regulations that governments are imposing on financial institutions, particularly when it comes to dealing with small accounts. See, if you have a large account, right, you got a million dollar client, a $5 million client, you know, there, the costs of compliance are low enough that, you know, you can afford to have the human advisor and, and, and brokerage firms make money. Where brokerage firms are increasingly losing money is on the smaller account because that's where the cost of compliance goes through the roof. And that's why so many firms keep upping their minimum and it makes it harder and harder for small investors to actually find a brokerage firm that will deal with them. I mean, that is the problem with government, right? Government says we're going to write all these rules and regulations to protect the little guy. But now the rules and regulations are so cumbersome and they create so much liability for the brokerage firms that they don't even want to deal with the little guy anymore. So now the government has protected the little guy right out of uh, the market. Nobody will work with them. And now they just end up getting scammed. But now what's happening is, OK, we're just going to give the little guy a robot. But of course, when everybody is getting robotic advice, nobody is going to get advice that's outside the mainstream. That's going to be the point of these robots. They're all going to be cookie cutter advice, asset allocation, pre-programmed. They don't think everybody's going to have the exact same advice. All the advisors are going to be the same. Yeah, at least, you know, if you go to some of these big firms and if you don't have a lot of money, you got a fifty or $100,000 account, you know, you could interview different brokers and some brokers might have a different investment philosophy. You might, but, but now they're all going to be exactly the same. They're all going to be spitting out the exact same recommendation as long as you give them the same facts about yourself. And I bet, you know, these things are going to be recommending pretty high allocations to U.S. treasuries or, you know, overpriced U.S. stocks. No matter how expensive the market will be, they'll still have their allocation to U.S. stocks. But I can see the U.S. government really getting involved in here. If you want to be protected from litigation, then you've got to basically recommend the type of investments that the government says are appropriate. Because after all, it's the government that's the judge and the jury here. And so if you make recommendations according to the government's 
uh, investment plan, well, then you've done nothing wrong. It's only when you deviate from that plan, right? Oh, recommend something like a gold stock. Whoa, there. Well, that's crazy, right? That's Nobody could recommend something that ridiculous. I mean, why don't you just recommend, you know, U.S. Treasuries or some NASDAQ stock, right? So this is really going to dumb down the quality of investment advice that the smaller investor is going to get Thanks to the government, of course, it is going to destroy a lot of jobs because a lot of people that get into the brokerage industry that work with smaller clients, you know, you got to work your way up the ladder. Well, that ladder is not going to be there anymore. If all these entry level advisory jobs are going to be automated and they're going to be performed uh, by by computers and it's not because the customers prefer it, they don't prefer it. Nobody prefers it. I mean, I never prefer to be on the, on the phone with a computer. I mean, half the time I start yelling and screaming at these things, you know, and because the programs don't always necessarily, uh, you know, get your voice recognition right. And sometimes it's very frustrating. And a lot of times when I get on the phone, all I just say is agent, representative, representative agent. I just say this stuff until I finally get out of the computer maze and I get to talk to a real human being. But everybody would prefer to talk to a human being from the beginning, right? The reason that we don't get our preference is because the government has regulated that preference and made it uneconomical for businesses to allow it. So now everybody is kind of forced uh, into this automation, even though they would prefer uh, the human touch. But the government makes the human touch too expensive, and so we end up with automation. That is what's going to be happening here in the financial services industry with all of these uh, you know, robotic advisors. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.